What's best for me? I just need to know. When I follow my dreams, there can't be obstacles. God, I love you so much. Can I have some bliss and comfort and power? Wait, I'll grab my list. Is that how this works? You say that you love me. Ask and receive. Does that include money? Wait, this isn't right. Did I forget? The doorway to heaven is small for the rich. If the dream leaves a weight of shoulders that break from the boots that I used crushed under my weight, am I being selfish or am I just driven? Are God and my feet saying something different? What if I made my dream the same dream as God's and it held more worth to suffer than prod? I'm absolutely convinced that the God who made us, the God who loves us, when we come to the cross and receive Jesus, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, he wants us to be world changers. I believe that. The dilemma is we think of world changing as having to change the whole world. When that's really not our call. Our call is to make a difference right where we are. And so we've said this little line again and again in the last couple of weeks. One decision, one action, one person. You can do that. I I can do that. We can make one decision that honors God, take one action, it impacts one person, and that begins to change a friendship, a, a school campus, a workplace, a home, a neighborhood, a community. And so every day we, we, make, we make one decision, we take one action, we impact one person, and day after day, year after year, it begins to transform the world. That's God's desire for us. And the Apostle Paul, this older leader and Christian who had, had hated Jesus, fought against Jesus, came to faith, and had lived a full life serving Jesus, suffering for Jesus, counting the cost for Jesus. He's now in jail, he's drawing near the end of his life. And he writes this little letter to Timothy. It's the second letter he's written to him, so it's called 2 Timothy. And in this letter, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, you're supposed to be a world changer. Paul says, I've I've done my part. I've run my race. Timothy, now I want to see you live for Jesus. So in the first chapter, he says, Timothy, be unflinchingly loyal. You can change the world when you're a loyal person and you stick to the one who loves you, Jesus, and the things he's called you to. Be unflinchingly loyal. It'll change the world. In chapter 2, he talks about being relentlessly truthful. Learning to speak the truth in love. To know the truth, Jesus. To know his word. To live within it and to speak that truth. That will change the world. And in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and if you have your Bible, you can turn to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. If you have your Bible app, you can open there and just keep a bookmark there. We're going to come to that in a moment. But in in 2 Timothy chapter 3... Paul is saying to Timothy, there's another attitude that you can change that'll make you a world changer. And that is to be willingly sacrificial. Make a decision and choose to be willingly sacrificial in a world that is a me-centered world. We live in a world that really is all about me and what I want and what I'd like. And Paul says to Timothy, we're called to be world changers. And that means making a decision to be willingly sacrificial. So when we look at the apostle Paul, And each week we're kind of trying to see this relationship. So Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. And and Paul had written a number of other letters. In a letter he wrote to the the Christians in the city of Corinth. And it's the city of Corinth where the people that live there are called Corinthians. And in a letter he wrote to them, he's explaining how he had served faithfully. And he says, "I, I, I don't want to brag about what I've been through, but other people are bragging and they're trying to make a point. And he says, let me make a point of what it looks like to really serve Jesus. So he says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul says of these people that are bragging about themselves, he says, are they servants of Christ? And then he kind of, as a side, says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. He says, I'm just going to be a little crazy here, okay? But I'm out of my mind to talk like this. Are they servants of Christ? He says, I am more. And then he talks about what he'd been through. And listen to what Paul says. He says, I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently. That's in prison for following Jesus, for preaching the word. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. He had 195 scars on his body just from preaching and serving Jesus. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. What did this guy's body look like after all of this? He says, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, and it goes on. 
Paul says, Timothy, you need to understand, this is some of the stuff I went through because I followed Jesus, because I heard his call. These things didn't happen because I was doing bad things. These things happened because I was following Jesus who gave his life for us. And then we meet Timothy. He's leading in a tough setting. Timothy is a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And the city of Ephesus is a, is a difficult city. There's lots of pushback. There's lots of resistance. And so Timothy is trying to hang in there and be a good pastor in a tough setting. And Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He, says, he wants Timothy to know. He says, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul says, Timothy, you got to understand something. If you choose to live a godly life and follow Jesus Christ, there's going to be some kind of persecution. I don't know what it's going to look like for you or somebody else or for me, but Paul says, this is part of the deal. And I, I think that's true all through time. There's, there's, there's a cost that's paid. There's consequences to following Jesus in the world back then and in the world today. But here's the, the weird dynamic. Uh, we live in a world where the normal thinking is that life should be an easy road to travel. Even though much, much of what we experience doesn't uh, bear that out, we kind of have this thinking, this thought that you know, life should be easy, I should just have a lot of fun, everything should be smooth going. And, and, and this sort of becomes part of our thinking. Life should be an easy road to travel. So, so here's what we start to think if we, if we aren't careful. We're driven, we can be driven by our desires. And we think this, if I want it, it must be good. If I want this experience, then it must be a good experience. I deserve this experience. If I want this thing, I should have it because I deserve it. That, that's the world that we live in. We live in a world where, where we can talk about having a bucket list. I got a bucket Here's the 20 things I want to do before I kick the bucket. I want to experience this and see that and travel here and do that. You know, turn the clock back 100 years and people, people's bucket list would be this. I'd like to have a new bucket. Um, you know, to draw water out of my well. And my lifespan is like 55 years old. And it's like, I mean, we have the luxury in our world today of thinking about me and us and getting what we want. But this, this isn't, and let me be clear. We worship a God who loves to bless his children. He gives us good things and God delights to bless us. But he doesn't promise that we'll always have everything go our way. He doesn't promise the road will always be easy. And if you believe that, you're reading a different book than the Bible. Because the Apostle Paul gives a list of the things he suffered. And he says, Timothy, anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's going to be some bumps along the road. It's not always easy. But we have this thinking that everything should be smooth. And then we have this constant diet of media. Painting pictures of people who are, who I think if we're not careful, we can see them as normal or normative. I asked our team to get me some pictures of different media images of different shows. And I'm just going to flash these up there quickly. And I want you to just think, are, are, are you seeing models of people who are self-sacrificing and serving and pouring their lives out for others uh, on a show like The Real Housewives of anywhere? We'll try Beverly Hills. You know, is, is the message, hey, live like this, be kind and serve and sacrifice for others. Or turn the clock back a little bit, get a little bit younger here, Jersey Shores. Even if you've never seen the show, here's the cast. Um, are, do their faces scream service and self-sacrifice for others, you know? <laughs> now, their biceps scream something, but uh, even the women, everyone's got biceps there. Uh, or, or, or even the daytime dramas that, pe that people have been watching for years. I thought, when I saw this picture, I thought the young and the restless might still be restless, but they're not as young as they used to be. Um, <laughs> some of them have been on the show for like 40 years, right? But, but is, is the message of the media, the show, one of serving, who are the characters that are serving faithfully and caring and sacrificing for others? Or even one of the first shows to kind of become the made-for-TV, non-top, you know, there used to only be a few stations, and there's more stations, but The Sopranos ran for years. People loved it and watched it. Is, is, who are the characters? Let me ask you this. Who are the characters in any of these shows, or pick a show you like to watch. Who are the characters that model sacrifice gentleness, compassion, generosity, kindness. Who are the characters in the shows we watch that we would say, boy, if I had a grandson or a granddaughter, I'd want them to be like that. 
or are most of the characters about me? And so I, I think sometimes when, when we fill our minds and breathe the air of this world, we can start to take on the messages of the world. And oftentimes it's about me. It's about what I want. And this is even true, and I've got to say this as a pastor, of Christian ministries that celebrate selfishness. We've got to be careful. There, there are Christian ministries where the primary message is not Jesus sacrificed and laid his life down, follow him and count the cost, but it's Jesus gave his life so you can get out of hell, go to heaven, and have lots of goodies in life. And if you receive Jesus, things will always go your way. You'll always be happy. You'll always get along with people. You'll always have enough money. You'll always be healthy. Your, your, your joints will never get sore. You'll never get arthritis. Life will be perfect. And, and, and people can send that message. And I had somebody send me a link to a video that I sat and watched the other day of a pastor who's saying to his constituents, okay, we, we, might, we might already have three jets, but we need a fourth one. It's going to be 50 to $60 million. And the ministry needs a fourth jet because when I'm flying places, sometimes we have to stop and refuel. And that's an inconvenience. And I just, and as a, pa- as a pastor, I watched this and I just thought, and, and, I, I try, and I'm trying to be, I'm not mentioning names, and I'm trying not to be judgmental, but, but there's something in my heart that says, I, I just don't know. Have we breathed too much of the air of the world? to believe that we need a fourth jet so we never have to stop for, don't have to stop for fuel between places because I just, it, it, it creeps into our hearts and our souls if we're not careful. And, and Jesus had a message for us th- th- to follow him and to follow him is to be like him and Jesus laid his life down. And so if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter three and as we begin that chapter, we discover that the new normal of the way our world is now is not so new. It's been around a long time. So Paul says to Timothy, listen, he says, we're, we're entering into times that, that are our last day times. And I think we've been in the last days for a long time. And I think we'll be in the last days till Jesus comes again. However long that is, I don't guess the timing. I don't do that. But, but, but Paul says to Timothy, he says, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. And then he lists 19 things that mark the world as, as we're struggling with, I think, being about ourselves and not about the things of Jesus. Listen to what he says. In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Just linger there for a minute. Wow. Does that sound like some ancient thing or does that sound like a lot of what our world is like? And if you want to be a world changer, part of the call of Jesus is say, I am willing to sacrifice and count the cost to follow Jesus. And that means I don't always get my way and what I want. I try to pursue God's way and what he wants. So the call and the vision of God is that we would be willingly sacrificial. And Paul shares three different things with Timothy that I think we can kind of, kind of look at this conversation and realize that God's, by the Spirit, speaking through Paul to Timothy, but we can listen to God speaking to our lives as well. So here's the first thing that Paul says to Timothy. He says, follow the example of godly and sacrificial leaders. Paul says, Timothy, find those people who've been godly and sacrificial and learn from them and become like them. And so Paul says to Timothy, I'm mentoring you. I'm pouring into your life, so look at my life. Look at verse 10 of 2 Timothy 3. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings. Paul says, you know all about my life. I've gone through these things. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. You know, Paul says, I've gone through a lot. And it's interesting, a couple times in Paul's letters, he says things like this, I've gone through a lot, but God delivered me from everything I've gone through. He said, wait a minute, Paul, you just said you were beat five times with the 39 lashes. You said that you were stoned. You said that you were beaten with rods three times. God delivered you? He says, yeah, God delivered me. He held my hand and he took me through the other side of it. That's what Paul meant by deliverance. When Paul says God delivered me from all these things, he doesn't mean he kept me from going through them. He says, he took me through them and I became who he wanted me to be. That's part of what it means to follow Jesus. 
and where we're willingly sacrificial, God can use us in ways that are astounding and beautiful. So here's, here's a question for you. Who inspired you to lay down your life for Jesus? And will you follow in their footsteps? Who's a person in your life? Maybe a, a grandfather, a grandmother, a parent, a pastor, a youth leader, a friend. Who, whose life do you look at and say, man, she followed Jesus or she follows Jesus no matter what the cost and I want to be like her. Man, he stands strong in his faith no matter what. I want to be like him. Who is that for you? For Timothy, it was Paul. Timothy could say, man, when things get tough in my life, I can remember what Paul's gone through and it gives me strength. I had a guy in my church, the first church I pastored, when I, I was uh, there as a senior in college, three years of seminary, and then four years out of seminary. For se- seven years, I was at, this, at the same church and, uh, down, at, down in San Dimas, down here in Southern California. And there was this guy named Keith. He was, he was on the elders board. He was on, on the L team of the church. He also, he and his wife led Bible studies, and he was super involved in serving in any way he could. And this guy, Keith, was all, whenever something would come up in the church, he would say, he would say Pastor, how can I help? And oftentimes it was the financial thing. He said, how can I help? If you need help, let me know. Always let me know. So one day I was going to my, one of my, I was still in seminary and I was going to seminary class and he had enough time with, because he owned his own company. He had started with nothing, started a company. It became very successful, did very well for himself. So he took a day off and came, in just to, came to classes at seminary with me one day just to see what it was like. He later actually sold his business, went to seminary, got a degree and became a pastor. I think he became a pastor when he was in his 60s. But, um, but this guy, Keith, we we're driving out to my seminary class and I just picked his brain. I love learning from people that are more mature than me, which is I can learn from a lot of people. And so uh, I, just, I asked him a bunch of questions, and I, and I got into his sacrificial kind of lifestyle. He just was always sacrificing for Jesus. And I said, Keith, how did you learn to tithe? How did you learn to give that first 10% to God's work? Because I knew that was, giving was a big part of his life. He said, well, he kind of explained. He says, but you know, he said, I don't tithe anymore. He said, if I were to tithe, I would be being disobedient to God. And I was, well, what, what do you mean? He says, yeah, he says, God called me some years back to give 50% of everything I earn to his work. And then God told me the other 50% I can use for me and my family, but keep my hands open in case he, God needs that too. And I thought, I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> but Paul says, look at people who know how to live sacrificially and learn from them. Watch their example. And I, I keep a book in my study here at the church called Prayers of the Martyrs. These are prayers lifted up by by our, our brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, your brothers and sisters who've died before us, they've all, they all died because they stood for their faith. And when I start feeling like, you know, if I start feeling sorry for myself or boy, I'm having to sacrifice a lot or if my perspective gets skewed, I'll sit down in my study and I'll read this. And I'll read these prayers of my brothers and sisters who gave their lives for Jesus. And it just puts everything in perspective for me. And it doesn't mean that my struggles aren't my struggles and they're real. I'm not saying they aren't real. But it just gives me a, a different outlook. So I want to read a couple of these prayers that kind of get me back, get my perspective back in the right, on the right path. This is Gabra Michael, who died August 28th, 1855, because they refused to deny Jesus. Here's their prayer. Let me be steadfast in my faith to the end. I have no hope of seeing my brethren again in this life. If they kill me, let me die as a witness to my faith. If I live, let me go on proclaiming it. I love that. If they kill me, let it be a witness to Jesus. If I live, let me talk about Jesus. Man, that just, that reorients my heart. Genesius of Rome, killed under the persecution of Diocletian in 285 AD, wrote this. There is but one king that I know. It is he that I love. It is he that I worship. If I were to be killed a thousand times for my loyalty to him, I would still be his servant. Christ on my lips, Christ in my heart, no amount of suffering will take him from me. Man, that's, that's a brother I'll meet one day in heaven. But now his words and his prayers inspire me. And one more. Ignatius of Antioch, one of the early church fathers, in 107 AD, he was killed, thrown in the arena with wild beasts and was killed for entertainment for people. And he prayed this, now at last I am beginning to be a disciple. No earthly pleasure can bring me any good. No kingdom of this world. It is better for me to perish and obtain Jesus Christ than to rule over the ends of the earth. Let me win through to the light and that done, I shall be complete. Let me suffer as my Lord suffered. 
And this just goes on and on. It's just a little book with a collection of prayers of Christians who paid the ultimate price to hold to Jesus. We need that kind of perspective. Paul says, look at those who are showing an example of living that kind of life and learn from them. The call and the vision of God is that we would be willingly sacrificial. Here's the second thing Paul teaches Timothy. That the call of every Christian is to surrender, suffer, and count the cost. Paul says, Timothy, this is built into the deal. To follow Jesus is to have the greatest of all blessings, the greatest of all joys, but it is also a pathway of surrender to Jesus no matter what. Jesus said this. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus said, this is what it looks like to follow me. There's times you're going to have to deny yourself. There's times you're going to take up the cross and give your whole life for me. And all the time, you follow after me. For those that are followers of Jesus, we need to hear that. If we want to be world changers, we got to be ready to count the cost of following Jesus and be willing to follow him no matter what. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you, and you, and you pray to receive him as your leader, I want you to know right now, he leads you on a bold adventure of following him, of surrendering, of giving him your life. There's nothing more wonderful, but there's nothing more challenging than following Jesus. So Paul says to Timothy, modeling this call to be willing to lay our lives down to follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, it's getting worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul says it's getting bad. It was back then, it is today. And yet we follow Jesus no matter what. So here's the question. What sacrifice can you joyfully and willingly make for the one who sacrificed everything for you? Jesus gave everything for you and me. What can we sacrifice for him? And hear this very clearly. We are not saved by doing good things. We don't do sacrificial things and then God notices us and says, okay, I'll bring you to heaven because you did good things. We're saved by the grace of Jesus and his death on the cross, period. We put faith in him, that's what saves us. But when we know how he sacrificed for us, Here's the beauty of it. We want to follow him. We want to lay our lives down and surrender to his will and watch what he can do through people who live that way. What sacrifice can you joyfully and willingly make for the one who sacrificed everything for you? Maybe it's sacrificing time to serve. One of my most precious commodities is my time. If I give my time, I'm making a sacrifice. Maybe you can lay down some time to serve in the name of Jesus. Maybe you can give some money to support the work of Jesus. Maybe you can give prayers to unleash the power of Jesus. Maybe you can extend forgiveness to somebody who needs to be forgiven because Jesus called. That's, there's a sacrifice. I'm not going to keep holding on to my bitterness. I'm going to extend forgiveness. Will you follow Jesus and count the cost? The call and the vision of God is willingly being willingly sacrificial. So here's the third thing that Paul teaches Timothy. The sacrifice of knowing, loving, and following the Bible in our radically changing world. Paul says to Timothy, if you want to be a world changer, one of the ways you can sacrifice is get to know this book and follow what it says. If you know this book and live what it says, you will learn to sacrifice. Why? Because this is a story of people who loved God who counted the cost. And you'll be inspired and challenged and learn how to do that. So Paul says to Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 14 and following. He says, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. He says, you know God's word you have from your childhood. I didn't have that growing up. Some of you did. I hope you appreciate if you had a family that taught you God's word in a way that was loving and grace-filled. And Paul says in verse 15, and how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all of God's word, all the Bible, all scripture is God breathed. And it's useful, but watch this, for teaching, rebuking, that's pointing out something that's wrong, correcting, that's fixing what's wrong, and training in righteousness, that's equipping us 
to live for God. All scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what God wants. He wants you and me prepared and equipped for whatever good work he calls us to. And most of those good works will cost us something. Time, energy, focus, uh, whatever it is, resources. But we're willing to lay it down. And so if you want to become a world changer, get to know this book and live out what it teaches. That will change your life, change your heart, and change our world. Let your life come in line with the word of God. Paul says to Timothy, you know, you're gonna read the Bible sometimes and you're gonna be rebuked, you're gonna be corrected, you're gonna get trained. That's challenging stuff. So here's the question. Will I follow God's will and word even when it costs me? Will I know God's word and will I follow it even when it stretches me, even when it costs me, even when I'm paying a price? Are we willing to do that? That's the kind of person that God uses to change the world and to make a difference. And so when you read this book, there's times where it will rebuke. There's times where it will correct. There's times where you're gonna get trained in something that you weren't trained in before, but say, God, speak to me. And this is one of the reasons why we encourage you week after week here, open the book, listen to it. You know, use an audio Bible, read it, but get it in your mind and get it in your heart and let it transform your life. God calls us to be world changers. And that means willingly sacrificial in our lifestyle. And here's the beauty of it. Jesus Christ is the one who models this for us. There's no one who's lived on this planet that was more willingly sacrificial than Jesus. He left the glory of heaven to come and to give his life for us. So here's what I want to do with the moments we have left. I want to walk you through the simple story of Jesus. I want to remind you of what's called the gospel, which means good news. I want to tell you the simple story of Jesus in a way that I hope will make sense and connect for you. And then I'm going to ask if you want to pray in one of two ways. If you're already a follower of Jesus, if it was a, a week ago or a year ago or 60 years ago, you prayed to, to receive Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to raise your hand and to say, Jesus, I want to count the cost and serve you more than I ever have before. So I want you to be thinking about that in the next moments, all right? And then I want to offer a chance to pray for anyone who says, I've never received Jesus. Or I'm not certain that I've received Jesus and I want to today give him my sins and my wrongs and accept his grace and become his follower. So I want to share the story of the gospel then I want to lead you in prayer. And I invite every person here to think about how they may respond. So, so here's, here's the picture I want to give to you. Here's the picture. The gospel begins with God's love. There is a God who made us, who's glorious, who's powerful, and he created us. He made the heavens and the earth. He made us. He delights in us. He loves us. And this God who made everything, he wants to be in relationship with you and me. He wants to take our hand and walk with us. That's the heart of God. God loves us, and he wants to be in relationship with us. That's the truth. And here's the next thing. There's a problem. And here's the problem. Every one of us, has sinned against God. We've thought things we shouldn't have thought. We've done things that we shouldn't have done. We, we've said things we shouldn't have said. We failed to do good things we should have done. And here's my life. Here's your life. And our sins are ours. They're on us. And so God, who's perfect and holy, wants to have a relationship with us, but there's this separation. There's this thing between us. It's called our sins. That's the problem. And God who's perfect and holy can't just ignore those things. It's that they have to be dealt with. The price has to be paid for those. So, so God, so here, here's God. He loves us. He wants to be in relationship with us. Here's us. We've sinned in our thoughts, our words, our actions, what we fail to do, and we cannot connect with God with these sins on us. Now, here's, here was God's solution, and this is beautiful. You have to get this. All right, there's God who loves us, who wants to be in relationship with us. He left the glory of heaven, and he came into human history. We call it Christmas. Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. He left the glory of heaven. God Almighty took on human flesh. He lived a life with no sin and no wrong, but they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, watch this now, he said, I'm paying the price. It's finished. He paid the price so that all of our sins could be placed on him. He offered forgiveness for all of our sins. Not that he ignored the problem, he paid the price. You see the picture? Here's this God who loves us. 
and cherishes us and made us and delights in us and he wants to be in relationship but we've sinned against him and there's this separation so God's solution is that I will leave the glory of heaven I will come as one of them I will, and I will feel the nails I will take the punishment I will take the judgment of all of their sins but here's the last thing God doesn't force us to believe in him and he doesn't force us to receive him. So we have our sins. God doesn't come and say, I force you to believe in me. I force you to give me your sins. He says, I offer my life. I paid the price. I've done it all. I will throw your sins in the deepest sea. Just give them to me and follow me. Become my follower and give your life to me. And we get to choose. We get to decide, are we going to say, Jesus, I confess my sins and I offer them to you. And when you do that, when you receive Jesus Christ, he throws those sins in the deepest sea. They're gone. Never to come back again. All your sins, past, present, and future, are gone when you receive Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. But I love how in the book of Revelation it says, Jesus says, behold, I stand and I knock at the door. He doesn't say I kick it in, I'm gonna force myself on you. He says, I offer myself to you. So I wanna lead in two prayers right now. Let's, let's just quiet our hearts if, you're, if, you want to, if you want to bow your head, if you want to close your eyes, you can do that, but let's just quiet our hearts for prayer. And I'm gonna ask you, if you know that there's a point where you said, I've received Jesus, I've confessed my sins, he's taken my sins, he's thrown them in the deepest sea, I'm his son, I'm his daughter, you know that. And today you say, Jesus, I want to follow you more passionately. I wanna serve you more fully. I wanna count the cost even when it's difficult, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you in a new, committed way and offer you all that I am. If that's your prayer today, I want to ask you to do something in the worship center, in the family worship venue, and online. Even if you're online at home or with your family, would you raise your hand as high as you can and keep it in the air so as we pray, in a sense, this is your hand reaching up to heaven. You're not showing me. You're saying, God, I'm lifting up my hand, saying, God, that's my heart. That's my desire. I want to serve you more. I want to follow you more. I'm willing to count the cost. I don't know what it is yet, Jesus, but when you show me, I'm going to do my best. And just hold your hand up and keep it high in the air. Oh, God, I thank you for the hands raised in the worship center and the family worship venue and even in homes around the world right now. Lord, we raise our hand to say, Jesus, thank you that you gave your life for us. Thank you that you paid the price for our sins. Thank you that you wanted to be in relationship with us so much, God. You came among us and took our sins on yourself and paid the price. We thank you. And now, Jesus, we raise our hand to say, Jesus, choose me today. Choose me tomorrow. Show me how I can serve. Show me how I can love. Show me how I can give. Show me how I can care. Show me where I need to forgive. Jesus, help me count the cost to follow you. Even when it's scary, let me trust in you. Wrap your arms around me and lead me forward as your follower all the days of my life until I see you face to face one day in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, keep your heads bowed and your, put your hands down now. And now I wanna to talk to those who you say, I, I've never received Jesus or I'm not sure. I really don't know. I'm not confident that I've said yes to Jesus and confessed my sins to him. And I wanna do that right now. I wanna to say to Jesus for the first time, Jesus, be the one who takes away my sins, who leads my life, who washes me clean. And I wanna follow you with all the strength you give me. If that's you today, would you raise your hand and raise it high like you're reach, reaching up to God? And just raise your hand real high. And, and if, when your hand's up, would you just look up at me real quick so I can see, so I want to let you know, okay, good, thanks so much. So there's other people, just raise your hand up high there. And I want to just see if you, in the worship center, raise your hand, there'll be a pastor in there to see your hand. Is there anybody else? Just raise your hand up high so I can see you and just want, I want to have a prayer for you. Okay, right over, if you look up, okay, good, thanks, great, thank you so much. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. If, if I can't, there's some spots in the worship center that are kind of dark. Okay, up over here in the balcony. I'm seeing people, okay, okay, over there, good. Good, okay, over here. Okay, great, right there. Right there, two hands. Look up in the front of the balcony on the right here. Just look up at me. I see one and two hands right there, okay. And if I can't see your hands, here's the point. God sees your hand in the family worship venue and at home. Keep your hand raised high. Let's pray together right now for those folks. Just let this be your prayer to God. Dear God, this moment and this day, I offer you, I give you all my sins. I don't want to carry them anymore. I can't carry them. I can't pay for them. But I say thank you, Jesus for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my sins. Thank you, for Jesus, for giving me new life and you sacrificed your life for me. Thank you, Jesus. Now I give my life to you. I wanna follow you. I wanna live for you. And as your hand's lifted, I want you to say to him, Jesus, I will count the cost. I wanna learn what it means to live for you no matter what it takes because you gave everything for me. I wanna do it as an act of love because of the grace you've shown me. 
And I want to say right now that those of you that just raised your hand, you can put your hands down now in the, you know, online and in the worship center in the family worship venue. God saw your hand. I want to say two things to you. Number one, the Bible says the angels of heaven celebrate when one person puts their faith in Jesus. Heaven is celebrating right now because your forever has been changed. And I want to challenge you in just a moment after I say amen to our closing blessing, I want to challenge you to go to the Connection Center and my wife Sherry will be right there. She wants to give you a Bible and a 50-day reading plan and also if you'd be willing to, to connect you to somebody who can just walk with you on what are the next steps. Do you, need, do you want to be baptized? Do you want to have somebody kind of walk alongside of you and encourage you any way we can help you take next steps in faith? They want to walk alongside of you. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave everything for us. You paid the price. You gave your life. You loved us beyond description. You solved the problem of our sin by taking it on yourself. Jesus, you amaze us with your sacrifice. So our prayer is that we would live for you. We receive your blessings with joy. We'd enjoy all the goodness of this life, but we would also count the cost. And when you call us to Jesus, we would do all you call us to do, even when it's tough. And we can say like the Apostle Paul one day, that you delivered us from all these tough things because you walked with us through them to the other side. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of salvation, unearned, freely given, and received by us with joy. We give you praise, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Before I give you a word of blessing to send you off, um, I want to encourage you, if you raised your hand here or in the family worship venue, would you go to the Connection Center? If you raised your hand at home, would you eat? You, there's, a, there's a live chat, chat and let us know that so we can follow up with you. If you want prayer for anything, come forward for prayer. And if you've got a big challenge in prayer, this team over here is ready to lay hands, anoint with oil, and pray if that's something you would request of them. If you, if you want to know more about Shoreline, the Connection Center has every answer you could possibly want. Go by and ask them about things at the church. And if you're brand new, go by there and let them give you a gift and thank you for coming and answer your questions. As you go from this place, you walk into a me-centered world. We breathe the air of this world. We can all be sucked into it. So let's follow Jesus. Let's count the cost. Let's enjoy his blessings but let's give our lives so fully to him that we willingly sacrifice when he calls us to and he will change the world through us. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week and go change the world for Jesus. Amen? Take care.